Hello everyone, please be welcome to the 20th International Conference on Electrical Engineering, Computing Science and Automatic Control. Today, uh, we're glad to present PhD Blanca Tobar Corona as our session chair. Please, you can start. Thank you. Hello everyone, good morning. Welcome to this session. In uh, Bio 1, Biomedical Engineering and Biomimetics. And in this uh, session, it's called Biomedical Prototypes. We are going to see several proposals for prototypes. And we are going to start with uh, our first presentation. The title of the presentation is Detection of Asymmetric Anomalies in Mammograms Using Dynamic Time Warping for Early Breast Cancer Identification. And presents Alonso Torres Vázquez from Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Please, Alfonso, whenever you are ready, please start. Hello, can you hear me well? Can you see me as well? Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes, yes, yes. OK. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to my exposition. My name. Alfonso, can you hear us? Can you hear yeah, us? Hello, hello. Uh, there was a bit of network issue on my side. I'm going to turn off my webcam. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, OK, I'm going to continue. Well, uh, as I was saying, uh, ah, but you can't see my presentation yet. OK. Can you see it now? Not yet. Not yet. I'm sorry, team sis kicking me out of the room for I don't know which reason. Uh, I'm going to try to make it as quick as possible. Can you see my presentation? You can, I think. We, we can't yet uh, see your presentation. I don't know why. So uh, Teams is telling me it is sharing my screen. <sighs> okay. Ah. We see it now. We see it now. Thank you. Okay, finally. Okay. Finally, so let's make it this quicker. Uh, I will be talking about our project called Detection of Asymmetric Anomalies in Mammograms Using Dynamic Time Working for Oh, Alfonso, we cannot hear you. Alfonso? Alfonso? Hello, Alfonso. Hello. Hello, hello. I can hear you, but 
uh, I don't know what's happening with Teams. Is kicking me out of Teams and shutting down the software. Uh, let's try one more time. Let me share my screen. Oops, this is not the right screen. This one. We can see your presentation. Okay, we can okay. Hear you. okay, thank you, thank you. Sorry for the inconveniences. Uh, breast cancer is a pervasive global health issue that knows no boundaries and continues to impact lives worldwide. Our collective efforts in research and innovation are crucial in addressing this challenge. Early detection is the linchpin in our fight against breast cancer. Detecting it in the, at an early stage can significantly enhance survival rates, sometimes reaching up to 90%. This underscores the importance of regular screening and self-examination. Physical asymmetry between breasts can be a subtle indicator of breast cancer. Recognizing this asymmetry is crucial, as it can be an early sign of an underlying issue that requires prompt attention. Our research addresses this aspect of breast health, offering innovative ways to detect and analyze breast morphology. When undergoing a mammogram screening, the detection of, of a de developing asymmetry is a key concern. Research indicates that if developing asymmetry is observed during such a screening, there is a 12.8% likelihood that the individual may go on to develop breast cancer. This figure underscores the importance of closely analyzing and acting upon even subtle changes in breast structure and shape. Notably, the degree of asymmetry is a crucial factor in this assessment. If the degree of asymmetry exceeds, exceeds 20%, it can be considered a possible indication of breast cancer. This threshold serves as a critical benchmark in our screening and diagnosis process, signaling the need for further evaluation and potential intervention. So how can we detect breast asymmetry automatically, given that we don't have as many experts in the field available for every person that has this disease, well, this, this pathology, we came up with using dynamic time warping. So what exactly is dynamic time warping? It is a signal processing technique. Uh, this technique enables us to analyze and compare sequences of data with precision and accuracy. It's an algorithm that goes beyond mere distance calculation, calculations such as the Euclidean distance or Manhattan distance. It's a method that recognizes patterns and relationships within sequences. One of the core capabilities of DTW is its ability to compute the optimal alignment between two sequences of data. Imagine it as the art of warping one sequence to precisely match the other, allowing us to discover subtle correspondences and anomalies in our data. This alignment process is pivotal in our pursuit of assessing breast cancer asymmetry. DTW's robustness sets it apart. It can handle irregularities, deformations, and variations within data sequences. The image on the right side, it's a comparison. The first image, number eight, is the Euclidean distance between two sequences. Let's name the first one sequence X and the second one sequence Y. And as you can see, it's basically the same sequence of data. It's a small uh, cosinal wave. But one, the, the bottom one is a little bit left, uh, right shifted. And if we use uh, Euclidean distance to compare both sequences, we could see that it just takes the first two points from each sequence and obtains the distance between one another. Although it doesn't work as well when they, they are dealing with shifted or uh, deformed sequences. For example, the start of the cosinal wave and point A is matched against uh, a different part in the shifted sequence area Y. Meanwhile, if we use dynamic time warping, we can see that one point from sequence X may match multiple points from sequence Y in order to handle these irregularities in data. So now that we covered the basics, let's talk about what we did in our project. First of all, Let's talk about the data set. Here's an example image from the data set. It, they were taken from University of Pittsburgh Text Information Extraction System. They consist of uh, 115 DICOM files uh, covering the medial lateral oblique view or and perineocaudal view. Here it's an example of a medial lateral view. 
As you can see, this example uh, shows a very asymmetric patient. What we did with the images was to pre-process them using DICOM uh, volume of interest lookup table that basically takes the pixel values and adjusts, uh, adjusts them based on the information from the, the X-ray machine. It can vary a little bit, but at the end, you get a nice image with better contrast. Then we apply a masking operation to clean the, the black background since a bit of doctor, well, a lot of doctors uh, annotate the background or draw shapes and, or arrows, so we didn't need those kinds of information in our project. Then, after cleaning the masks, we obtain the borders and centroids. The centroid center is depicted uh, by this red uh, stars, asterisk in the illustration, and the border is depicted in a yellow uh, color. After obtaining those characteristics, we computed the angles between the centroid and the border. We know there are some kind of issues. For example, here we have a little bit of inter costal uh, muscle, interpectoral muscle, that we don't need to take into account. So sometimes we adjust it by cutting up the information, like adding like a stop point to just take into account the breast information. After repeating that with the left side, we did the same for the right side. That allowed us to obtain a characteristic sequence of data from each breast so let's talk a little bit how we can use CTW uh, based shape analysis in this example. Given two curves denoted by X and Y, each with elements X1, X2, up to XM or XM. Here we have an example and the name image. I don't know if you can see my, my mouse, I think. So, well, uh, look at the X breast, the X shape, then the Y shape. We compute a cost matrix. The, basically, what it does is compute the optimal temporal alignment that minimizes the Euclidean distance between them. All this whole equation is uh, summarized in this figure. Basically, you take one point from sequence X, one point from sequence Y, and compute the Euclidean distance, and then try to take another point and see if it minimizes it. So you, can, you get, at the end, this black dotted path. So you get you can uh, match different points in sequence Y with different points in sequence X. At the end, we just need to compute the cost of uh, of this matrix. Basically, it's just the sum of the values in the in the warping path. Now let's see uh, some of our results. Uh, here's an asymmetric and an asymmetric and symmetric example. In figure seven, the first two uh, subfigures correspond to the asymmetric case. As you can see, the left breast, for example, uh, the nipple, it's found here, more or less at uh, 300, well, 350 pixels X, well, 14 is X and 315 Y, while the right breast is at 150 approximately and 120 pixels. So there's a huge difference in the shape of the breast. At the bottom side of the picture, we have a symmetric case. It's, based, it's almost as if it was a reflection, a mirror reflection. They're pretty much, uh, well, they're very similar, very symmetric. The DICOM volumes also contain the Byrots uh, tag. That's basically a system to classify a uh, uh, mammographic image based on the shape, uh, its density, different, uh, maybe if it has a tumor or something else. The number one is the lowest score, showcasing a healthy breast. And number four, five, and six, depending on which scale we are using, represents the the, the worst case scenario. Here is the center H edge angle distance curve we computed. For the asymmetric case, 
we can see the left wrist depicted in a blue line and the right wrist depicted in orange. We can see there's a difference between the nipples, a pretty noticeable oops, difference between them. While in the symmetric case, they match, uh, well, they pretty match, they match very pretty. The match is very pretty between them. There's a little bit of a gap, but it's okay. There, here's a interesting result we obtain. Sometimes there is a nipple retraction on one side of the breast, and in the other side, there Five isn't. Five minutes, please. Okay. Five minutes? Okay. There is a difference, and it can be seen when we uh, plot. Five minutes, the, please. Five. Okay, okay. Thank you. And it can be seen when plotted, for example. Here, the right, the right breast doesn't show a nipple because it is retracted or inverted, and the left breast does show it. It is interesting because not every time, but some of the times that a uh, nipple is retracted on just one side of the breast, it's an indicator of a, a possible pathology that must be explored and analyzed. So based on our work, what did we conclude? DTW is a promising technique to detect breast asymmetry. There is a distinction between virus groups based on their DTW score. This information can be explored more in our paper. I didn't want to include all the tables. It may be also applied for detection of asymmetric nipple retraction, but it is necessary to perform further research and validation studies to strengthen the robustness and generalization of this research. I think uh, I went a little bit too quickly, given our, my technical issues, but that would be all. Thank you for your time. If you have any doubts, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Alfonso. Uh, if there is any question here in the room, please. Yes, please. Yes, uh, that's, that's a very interesting uh, project. And I have one question. How do you guarantee that the difference that you found are due to the, in, to the difference in the, the breast and not in the way the images were taken? Ah, OK, that's a. Uh... Very, very important question to ask. Us. Okay, there, we explore all of data set, and yes, there are some cases, uh, typical cases where there is a problem during acquisition. That's why we use, um, of, for example, like an official data set taken and validated by Pittsburgh University experts instead of using um, another open source uh, data set available. We know that there might be a difference in the during acquisition between the left side and the right side. But for now, we're taking this as they were uh, evaluated and annotated as if they were, as if they were taken uh, following the right procedure. Also, any other question in the room, please? Uh, the ones that are online, please. Any question online? Maybe. Yeah, the chat there was some question. There was a question. Yeah. I have another question about the data set. How many uh, images? Did you take for your uh, project? Uh, I can hear you. I can hear you uh, very well. Uh, how many images? Uh, what? We're taking for. Yeah. Ah, we're taking. We're taking uh, 115. Study. Okay, 115 uh, cases. So that would make them 115 uh, multiplied by two because we have a left view and a right view, and. Yes, by two, yeah, 115 by two, and multiply by two again because we also have 
the media lateral oblique view and the media the cranial caudal views on her. Uh, 460 cases, if I'm not mistaken. Well, 460 images, if I'm not mistaken. I have another question in the same sense uh, about the database. From the total of your database, um, what is the percentage that is reliable for your method? Can you uh, the I database? couldn't hear it. Is it ready, clean? I couldn't uh, hear it as well. So, what percentage of database was? Okay, uh, the question again. In your database, what percentage can you use in total for your methods? I mean, well, it's ready, it has the annotations. Is 100% uh, of that database that you are using, or you selected some of the images with some criteria? Uh, we use all of them. Yeah, sometimes there's not need to pre-process them more than others. For example, there are images that have a lot of annotations, but most of them were pretty clean, in our opinion. We could uh, take just the rest area pretty easily with a uh, masking operation, for example, using a uh, OTSU threshold or a simple thresh binary threshold. Thank you, Alfonso. Uh, if there is no more questions, uh, there is a one for one more. Yes, please. The last one, just to ask, I mean, the, the technique employed in this project was but, but it is also a fact that you didn't use time series. The data that you extract as characteristics of these images was the distance created uh, from I'm, the central to the perimeter of the breast. Uh, so, I'm sorry, uh, I, I couldn't hear it as well because I think they uh, turned on another microphone. I could hear the echo for a moment. Okay. Alfonso, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, loud and clear, doctor. Uh, perfect. So, is the technique that you proposed for tackle this problem was dynamic time warping, but it's a fact that you don't have time series. The characteristic you extract from the images was properly the distance created from the center to the perimeter of the press. So, why did you employ dynamic time warping? Okay, that's an excellent question. Yes, the dynamic time warping is mostly used in. in Signal processing, where time is a crucial uh, characteristic. In our example, we took advantage of a Sorry, Alfonso. I'm sorry, it kicked me out again. Uh, okay. As I was saying, we took advantage of another work that did, in fact, use dynamic time, work, time warping to recognize the shape of different images, of different uh, objects and images. And also took advantage of the fact that dynamic time warping has several uh, characteristics. One of them is that it takes into account that one point in, the, in one sequence can match another point in the in the opposite sequence, but can't go back in time. For example, we don't have time, but for example, let's say, uh, okay, you're not seeing the image, uh, the presentation. Mm. I think I'm sharing my screen. Yes. Okay. For example, here, let's take the first point of this cosinal wave. This point can't cannot match the previous points in the other sequence. For example, that's an important characteristic of, of dynamic time warping, but it can match the corresponding point or the next corresponding point, and that can be adjusted by a threshold to see how many points can it travel before finding the corresponding match. So if we have this kind of border, we well, we thought that if we use well, this is a better picture. Yeah, that's the same same uh, same idea. If we have the start of the breast in this point and the sequence y, 
we couldn't match. Well, it doesn't make sense to match, for example, this points in sequence X in the other side of the breast. This points may uh, be, uh, this points may be a little bit of uh, pectoral muscle, for example. So that characteristic of dynamic time warping was also an important point in our work. Uh, you're, I think the audio is muted. Um, yes, I, I cannot hear you. Uh, do you think I can support this presentation? I will. Okay, let's continue you. with our second presentation, which is estimation of variations in progesterone in a woman across the menstrual cycle. And uh, is presented by Monica Vasquez Fernandez from Imas Unam. Thank you. share the results of the this work, estimation of variation in progesterone in a woman across the menstrual cycle. We start, the, I start, next, the next, I don't know that. Um, we use an um, image uh, with resonance magnetic, and then we, with this technique, we construct a volume, and there are many, uh, ways to obtain that image. Uh, one of these is ball response that we pair today in the magnetic field and we obtain some kind of image. Um, the ball response uh, with an image that we, and we, can, uh, we can reconstruct uh, a, a volume and, and we can see that image also in to be two dimension and the intensity of the color or the intensity of the gray scale uh, give information about the about the yes. um, then we obtain that um, image in a window of time. Um, it depends the the instrument of the system that uh, when the system that you use to acquire uh, that image um, and the order uh, that the system acquired the the image is different in each case. Uh, but you obtain a window. Um, become, um, I mean, we integrate or the system integrate uh, the information in that window. And with uh, with uh, and with that uh, system, we can see that image in different uh, planes. Uh, in this case, coronal, axial, and and sagittal cuts. Um, that image needs uh, processing, and the processing that we use was. Uh, Normaliza, normal, normalize that image uh, with a system uh, that is called M and Y. Uh, that is uh, the Massachusetts uh, okay. Institute Normalized Brain. And with that, uh, we normalized, uh, as you can see in that image, uh, in, the, the, in the, the lines in color blue, is the M and I system, and we normalize it with that the the structural image and the functional image. Image with the with that system, we can see different uh, volume: the gray uh, matter volume, the white matter, and cerebral spinal fluid volume. 
Sí. Then um, the, the, we can see the brain connection, the functional brain connection in the white mother. Uh, there are many ways to see that connection. This is a, um, a representation of that. Uh, and different scales, we use uh, the macro scale. And there are many ways uh, to obtain that image. We use, um, uh, the, the, in, in our case, uh, the woman under the test is in resting state. He is uh, resting and only resting, don't, don't have any task to do. And in, in this case, in healthy people, we can see that uh, that regions that have activity, um, that regions are calling the power mode network. Um, and, and then we are interested in see how the the connection, the functional connection, changed with a menstrual with the menstrual cycle. And it is a data uh, on, on average people who menstruate experience about uh, 40, uh, 40, 100 uh, menstrual cycles through the lifespan. And, and in this menstrual cycle, uh, a woman have different uh, chains in some hormones, we are only dedicated to observe, observe the change in progesterone. The progesterone uh, have a low level, and when we have in the four, uh, 14 day, the, pro, the progesterone start to, to increase her level, and it corresponds when the tissue uh, start to, to um, grow, and is that this uh, this will is, um, increase the, the volume and if um, the woman don't have a baby then the menaces start um, our methodology um, start with extract the data from a data set that is uh, open source um, we use two the data of two cycles. Uh, the first data uh, has 30, 30 volumes, uh, 30 volumes at our uh, age day. Um, the, the data of the image was acquired. And the first, uh, the first one. Uh, yeah. Sí. With the with the woman is consuming uh, oral contraceptive. Then use a uh, MATLAB and with the control toolbox and STM uh, software. Um, after we pre-processing that uh, image data, uh, we use uh, Python with TV library, and you you use also Python uh, with the network library to characterize the network. Then uh, well, we send trade in one algorithm that is calling uh, visibility, visibility graphs. Um, that uh, algorithm is used when you have a time series, and you use the time series. Then you uh, have uh, obtain uh, the paths uh, from one point to the all series. And then you transform that time series to a graph. 
um, then in the in that case uh, we use uh, all all images that have the functional that information about the functional connectivity in the brain and this was obtained in a, in an indirect uh, method uh, you measure hemoglobin blood flow with oxygen, oxygen in the arteries in the cell in the brain. And that information that what areas in the brain are have uh, activity. Then uh, from the, the, the volumes obtained, we, we use the time series, the time series, and that is an example from the, the first study and the second, no? with natural and oral contraceptive uh, study. Then you use uh, the algorithm to construct the visibility graph and then uh, obtain the, the graphs that I got showed in this. But with CON, uh, obtain the functional maps and you can observe that with the woman uh, is consumed a uh, contraceptive, the intensity of the the intensity is lower than when the woman don't consume a contraceptive. Um, we we think that uh, Um, consume contraceptive have effects in the quantity of oxide, oxygen that uh, that oxygen consumed by the brain can be a uh, can be an indicator that uh, that the the connectivity in the brain, the functional connectivity in the brain, that are other codes on other plants in the same case. In the same case, uh, you, you can see uh, where the woman do, doesn't, don't, doesn't consume contraceptive, the intensity is uh, higher than when the woman is consuming contraceptive. In the case that we use that data on um, one day, and in this case, the seven day that the progesterone level is low, the, the graphs are the same, the same geometry. But when you, uh, when the progesterone level increase, uh, we can see uh, there are difference between when the woman have natural cycle that, um, and when the women uh, are consuming an oral contraceptive. And this other day, the other peak of the progesterone, and we have uh, what also a change in the geometry of the graph. Uh, then we, we think that identifying uh, the areas with the highest functional activity during, during the menstrual cycle will help us understand the brain process that take place during the menstrual cycle. This analysis could be considered as a as diagnostical tool to determine the peaks of the variation of the progesterone, identify the, identifying the, the phase of the menstrual cycle of a woman through a progesterone level will be useful in some diagnosis and treatment of neural diseases. And one possible extension of this paper is to explore different networks metrics to evaluate the, pro the progesterone level in different days. And that's all. Okay. For your presentation. And if you have any questions here in the room, please. Yeah, Tom? Monica, nice to meet you. See you at the end. <laughs> you know, you're, you. you are always welcome to see the stuff and to the lab. And I have one question about your project. Uh, I I see that you are trying to see how progesterone var variates 
during the menstrual mis cycle. But what is the importance of your study? Uh, I, it is not clear for me because you are using intensive. And um, why, why is the, what is the main goal of your study? And um, in fact, we we start to explore that uh, because uh, one first the the data is in open source. No, we don't understand anything. Okay. Uh, in that case, but we are working with other uh, set of images that share um, a doctor in the ciclo hospital. And in that case, uh, we can realize that in some epilepsy, epilepsy fashion, woman epilepsy fashion, um, some, uh, sometimes the, the last convulsion, the uh, last uh, well, convulsion, strokes, strokes, no. Uh, I don't remember the name, but issues. 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 Uh, uh, have a relation with the menstrual cycle. In this case, uh, the name of the epilepsy is catamelial epilepsy. And we want to um, have a, a some, some way to try to that got information the, to the other study. And uh, for that reason, we start with with, uh, with this uh, working work and, and was a little bit uh, complex because uh, the brain is uh, the brain is um, flexible, no? and its many features can change from the connectivity, the age, the level of study, the many things. Then it's not easy, but was for for us was interesting to explore that it was a a world of a, an, an study and a student that was the social service with us and. Was a way to explore that that um, issue, and um, that is a little bit complex to to translate that knowledge to the other study of research that works. So, as far as I understood, you are using a database, a public database. Yeah, a public right? database. And um, are you planning to use uh, your own database? Yes, but it's very expensive. Yeah, and, uh, very we expensive. submit that project to the the owner yeah. okay. to give us the, <laughs> the money. The money. <laughs> then uh, this this week, uh, uh, other database of many women in not in other not in the full menstrual cycle, but in some specific dates. Um, but it's a database with the uh, woman because that was well only one woman. Yeah, a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other question here in the room? Are there any questions online, please? No questions online. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Monica, for your presentation. Okay, let's continue with our next presentation, which is detection and characterization of focused ultrasonic field using shear effect and continuous laser. Then presents Alejandro Rodriguez from Simbestaft.
Yeah. Well, first, welcome everyone and thank you to be here. My name is Alejandro Rodriguez Peña and today I'm going to present my the paper titled Detection and Characterization of Focus Lucas and Field Using Schlering Effect and Continuous Laser. Well, this is the agenda I like to talk about. First, uh, I will mention in the introduction some theory about the light attenuation and the Schlieren effect. Then in the methodology, I would like to introduce you to the experimental configuration that I use to obtain the results and discussions. And finally, well, the conclusions about, about all the, the experiments. Uh, moving on into the introduction, uh, first I would like to say that, that attenuation of light is a phenomenon that, that, uh, that uh, involves light, light and its interaction with different particles. First, light can be absorbed, reflected, transmitted or scattered when interacted with some particle. As I expose in this figure, figure number one, you can see that some energy of light can, can be reflected diffraction or with some particle that interferes its 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 pass its move and well the attenuation of light it you can say that it divides into two different phenomena the first is the scattering that is the conservation of light of energy but in an altered direction and then the absorption that is the extraction of extraction of this energy from the electromagnetic field radiation and with these two, these two phenomena, we have the attenuation, that is the total effect of the medium on the radiation passing through it. A, a, a important parameter in this is the complex refraction index, or as named as the optical constant of a particle that uh, involves just uh, the refractive index as, as the end. And please you need to point to the, to the, on screen with your finger. Okay. And K is the absorption coefficient, and with this, the optical constant defines the attenuation of light. Then, in this Lyron effect, this effect is, you can say, that is the interaction of, of the light with the interferences. These interferences are because of the alteration also in the density of the material and in the fraction index. Or in ultrasound, uh, this phenomenon is the interaction between an ultrasound field and an, and an, an electromagnetic wave. This because the relative permittivity of the material and more studies about this, this phenomenon define the coefficient named adiabatic physio-optic coefficient. This you can, you can see that is the, the interaction between the density and the refractive index of the material as the pressure waves move uh, or pass around the, the material. Uh, this phenomenon, this combination of ultrasound field and Schmieren effect is named as the acousto-optic effect. And in medicine, this, this phenomenon has application in shadow graph studies and alignment methods with ultrasound imaging. Well, uh, leave behind the, uh, the antecedents and some of the introduction. I would like to move on into the objective. This uh, was defined as the characterization of focus ultrasound field using the Schlieren effect and a continuous laser. This to evaluate the variations in the laser intensity in relation to proximity into the ultrasound focus and changes in the medium pressure. And this with the aim of providing an alternative or complementary technique for characterization of ultrasound fields in the field of health. In the experiment configuration, uh, to characterize the focus ultrasound field, I define these four big steps. First one is the generation of ultra ultrasound field. Here uh, involves the, the use of a focus ultrasound transducer to generate this ultrasound field. Then the implementation of Schlieren effect with a continuous laser passing through the medium that is analyzed. And then the medition of the laser variation, this into different location inside the medium. And finally, well, the characterization of ultrasound field, comparing the variation intensity with the pressures that generate the, the acoustic field inside the medium. In the experimental configuration, I define three main subjects. First, the continuous laser and the photodiode is the, the receiver, the measurement system. 
Then the ultrasound field characterization, and finally, uh, the ultrasound field generation. In the experimental configuration, the, the system of measurement was all about a polyriot. Uh, the component was the BPW21R with a two stage. The first one is a current to voltage converter stage, and the second one is a linearization stage. Uh, this, this measurement system uh, at the end has a range of 0 volts to 0 0.875 volts and a sensitivity of 0 0.05 millivolts per lux. And it was used a continuous laser of a power with a power of 0 0.5 milliwatts continuous laser with a wavelength of 530 nanometers in color green. It was used this wavelength because um, with the photodiode it was used. Um, it had it the photo the photodiode it was used has the the highest sensitivity with this with this wavelength. And then finally I present you the two diagrams of the measurement system. First an independent power source diagram and then the the two stages to to do the measurement. Second, uh, the, uh, the ultrasound field <coughs> characterization. It was used, as I, say, as I said, a concave transducer of 4 megahertz with a focus at 9.6 <coughs> centimeters with uh, only power of 5 watts. <coughs> Into the medium that was analyzed was a 0 0.7 agarose phantom. Uh, and to locate it exactly the point with the focus of the transducer uh, in the medium, uh, it was constructed a phantom with a liquid crystal sheet inside with those range of temperature, 40 to 45 centimeters. It, it was positioned di diagonally inside the phantom. This way we can we can define the exactly point where the, the focus of the transducer were, were inside the medium. And then with this specifically focus located, it was located at 3.2 centimeters to, through the phantom. It was defined another five locations, uh, three prefocal and two postfocal locations. And well, these, these were the, the exactly points that the laser were, were passing through the medium. And then uh, those are the points that we analyze. And these, these variation in the density were compared with the radiation pattern of the transducer in the exit plane, analyzed with a hydrophone. These to obtain the exact pressures, pressures of the of the transducer ultrasound generate in, in the medium. Uh, okay, well, how how do we do this 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 experiment? First, a box filled with water with the transducer placed at the bottom was constructed. This, this box was constructed with a specific, a specific parameters because we want to the phantom were exactly positioned at the top of the of the of the box, but uh, the box was fulfilled with water, and this way the phantom was only sub submerged into the water, uh, only in the bottom part. This we can we can achieve the impedance matching. And then the the other part of the phantom were free free from any interpolation, so the continuous laser can pass through and do the medicines. Uh, all the experimental uh, components were placed uh, in a nautical board, so to ensure the alignment of the of the laser and all the components, as I exposed in this figure nine. And that was the, the methodology and the experiment configuration. Passing through the results, I present to you in this figure 10 the laser intensity recorded along the established location I set and with a reference, a reference signal without any ultrasound this because we want to compare the variations in the intensity. Uh, as we can see here, laser intensities were recorded across the six established positions and the greater variations uh, and well, uh, we, we can notice here that the, the variations that are near the interface between water and, and, and phantom present a less, less variation if we compare it to the postfocal post focal locations. This may do because of the of the the transducer, the ultrasound propagation itself. 
And then, well, as, as I said, we compare these, these variations in the, in the intensity of the continuous laser with the, the pressure recorded along the, the ultrasound field, uh, the normalized, normalized pressure along the ultrasound field. And in this figure, I present the laser variations. And we, we can see that uh, at, at the interface zone between wire and phantom, the percentage variation are almost negligible, recording only at 0 0.75 degrees. Uh, this is at the laser location reduction at the exact point of the point, the focus. We have the highest, the highest variation with 11.02. And another thing I like to to say is that the variation in intensity are significantly perceptive since the changes in the pressure are su substantial for short distances less than one centimeter. And well, finally, the the conclusions. Uh, I have these four, four important points. First, that the, the pressure variation compared with the intensity of ultrasonic fields was uh, successfully recorded by a continuous laser, and the variations intensity were different depending on the position of the continuous laser. In this, this position, we select a maximum decrease of 11.02 was obscured in the focal locations. And then the, it was recorded a reduction related with the pressure generated inside the medium of study. And finally, when in the terms of applications, the methodology facilitates measurements and are significantly supplement measurement process. If we compare this, this procedure with conventional approaches. And well, for future work, we may explore analysis, uh, principally by varying parameters as variation and ultrasound power and frequency and such as different location inside the medium, and also we can change the translucency of, of the medium itself. And well, that's that's all for, for the exposition. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alejandro, for your presentation. Is there any question here in the room? Just a question regarding the phantom. I mean, I understand you designed the phantom with a specific physical characteristics, right? But inside the hypothesis, when you uh, build the phantom, did you thought about certain tissue re uh, resembling uh, a specific human organ or shape or something? Uh, no, well, in this in this case, the phantom was constructed that way because it has very similar similar characteristic with acoustic characteristic of with water, and that's that's the reason of the. Only you focus on the physical characteristics. Yes, the shape. No, no, right. The shape is important because of the. Ah, uh, yes, of course, but not the anatomical shape. Yes, that's that's it. No, thanks to you. Okay. Yeah, that was another question. Which are the main applications of this work to your final application? Well, uh, in medicine, uh, the Schmieren effect uh, is used it's, 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 it's used for for aligning methods in, in imaging. And we say that that those alignment methods use different different components such as 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 well, com com different different methods that that are complicated to do, and with this method we only use a emitter, a continuous laser, and a receiver, an optical receiver, and that's so. It simplifies the methods that that were were applying in different areas. Your thesis. In your thesis, which is the final application for you for your main work? For my main work, mm, is we can say that um, that is like um, it's a story of the uh, it's a story of how how this learning effect interact with the the continuous laser and how it can be used for for different work studying. So why don't you talk about the, the um, how do you see uh, the, the bubbles that are inside and we used to 
to open the brain, blood brain barrier, because that's that's the reason why we start to to explore this this method. Yeah, yes, that's uh, we can say that that is the habitation. Habitation. That's the next step. And the story that that interaction. But a previous step it was to to study uh, the interaction of the, the electromagnetic wave of an electromagnetic wave with the acoustic field. Uh, we first have to understand how light interacts with, with an ultrasonic field to then uh, pass that that investigation to the application exactly in, in cavitation. Another question here. Any question online? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Alejandro, for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, let's proceed. Is our next presentation, uh, which is characterization of a temperature gradient system for phantom studies in hypertermia therapy. And presents Fausto David from Simba staff. Well, welcome to everyone. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Fausto David Cortez Rojas, and I'm going to be presenting this work that is called Characterization of a Temperature Gradient System or Phantom Studies in Hyperthermia Therapy. So the content of this presentation uh, has an introduction, the objective of the work. I'm going to be showing the methods that we used in this work, the results, conclusions, and references. So I'm going to start talking about the thermotherapies. Uh, thermotherapy is a technique where we rise the temperature of tissues between 41 to 45 uh, degrees Celsius when we applied hyperthermia and we when we applied temperatures that are that are above 60 Celsius degrees Celsius we can call it ablation this kind of therapies uh, requires a rigorous temperature control because or in order to maintain our temperature in the ideal ablation temperature as you can see in this figure, and inside the Laremos laboratory, where I am working in this uh, project, we are uh, looking for another ways or another methods to measure the temperature in a non-invasive way. Because nowadays, the mainly we use um, invasive measurements or methods that are based in proofs like optical fibers or thermocouples. Also, there are technologies that allow us to measure temperature in a non-invasive way, as the ultrasound, the ma magnetic resonance, the computer uh, tomography, and the electrical impedance. But these uh, technology te technologies are very um, or are not accessible to to our maybe. Uh, the stage of this project. So, uh, in order to develop new methods to estimate 
temperature. We are working in uh, ultrasound. That is that technology that we can use in this stage. And this uh, specific project that I am presenting in this uh, this time, um, it's a group or it's just a step of a future experimentation that we are working in uh, the next uh, stage or in of this project. So currently we use uh, water measure methods in order to heat in samples and models, as you can see in this figure. In the top of the figure, you can see the, the method that we usually use, that is to put our phantom or our sample in water or in any fluid, and then we heat that fluid in, uh, to homogenize that uh, sample, or in this case, a phantom. But this method has some uh, back draws compared to other methods. One of them is that we have, uh, oh. we take a lot of time to homogenize the sample. We have poor, there's a lack of visibility of the sample, because in this case, I am showing you the, the phantom, but this is a bag made of metal, so you can see through this bag. Um, there is um, a poor time of action in temperature control, and the patterns that we can see in this method to heat samples or models uh, presents patterns that are not in clinical uh, applications when we apply hyperthermia or ablation. And also, I want to say that this is a previous stage available for different research approaches. So this is not the only application we can use our method or the method that we are proposing to another approaches. So the idea is that when you hit this, um, this experimental setup, you homogenize the, the temperature of the sample and the water at the same, same time. But uh, we want to create a gradient where we can put heat in the in the bottom of our container, and we can um, see another part that is cold in this case, or in a room temperature. So, our objective is to characterize an experimental setup capable of inducing a temperature variation in phantom producing a thermal gradient that emulates the conditions under which a thermal therapy is applied inside a given structure. So the methods are very uh, easy to, to understand. In this case, I am presenting the heating plate that is a part of our experimental setup. This heating plate is made of aluminum. So in order to validate the, the experimental setup that we are proposing, we conducted some um, validations uh, test. In this case, I am showing you showing showing you a figure in the item or the item A, the item B, and the item C are the same heating plate but at different temperatures. In the first one, in the item A, A, sorry, we can see the profile or the temperature profile obtained from the Fluke TI. 32 thermographic camera where you can see that the, the heating plate in cold or in a room temperature. In the item B, you can see the same plate but increased up to 35 uh, degrees Celsius. And in the item C, you can see the temperature of the same plate but at 50 Celsius degrees. So you can see here another uh, view of the, of this validation, you can see the distribution or the temperature distribution pattern. Also, we have the hidden plate. We put a a structure that is made of plexiglass. Inside this structure, we put our phantom, and we put water on the top in order to cold our uh, phantom body and also have another function that is to, to serve as a coupling medium. Uh, we put an insulator material 
in all over uh, all over the, the structure in all the walls of these structures. Uh, we have two sensors um, in to control the temperature that is uh, in um, that is induced uh, through the heating plate. We have eight sensors to monitoring the temperature inside the body phantom. These sensors are uh, driven by left view by a digital um, analogic converter. We put an Arduino card in order to uh, control the sensors. It has a relay model and it has a 12 volts power supply. So this is the complete setup. And the idea is that we have uh, the phantom in uh, temperature or a room temperature or a cold temperature. And we start to heating since the bottom of this structure and we create a gradient that is between 27 uh, degrees Celsius and 60 degrees Celsius. So the results are in this slide. You can see in the left side an image where we shown the monitoring thermocouples, the phantom body, the heating plate, also the aluminium base that uh, is in contact with the heating plate. You can see the power lines and the, the sensors and the insulating material that is in pink. And the right side of this slide, you can see the temperature profile obtained by the, uh, the temperature, the flux uh, camera, um, thermographic camera, sorry. And you can see the gradient that is uh, between uh, 18 and 62 de uh, degrees Celsius. So we also conducted a linear regression uh, in order to estimate or to infer the temperature inside the body phantom in any point of our uh, structure. So this is a correlation of the structure depth in the uh, in the phantom body and the temperature that presents. Also, we conducted uh, an equation. We calculated an equation. And finally, the conclusion said that the system is adaptable to various temperature ranges and mm, multiple process use. Um, we successfully recreated a temperature gradient between 27 and 60 degrees Celsius. But it can induce any lower temperatures, which may pose limitations for specific application. Uh, also, customized approaches are required to address temperature gradient variation based on phantom type and imaging technique. And this, is, this work is the stage or the initial stage in characterizing an experimental system for creating a database with temperature gradient images, promising application in image processing and thermography. And one of the future goals is to analyze diagnostic ultrasound uh, images uh, in the presence of temperature gradients, uh, actually BMO images, BMO ultrasound images, and overall understanding, understanding and mitigating temperature gradients are crucial for reliable results in medical studies, ensuring high quality images and accurate clinical interpretation. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor, for your presentation. Is there any questions? So I have a question. The first one, I think, may be a critical observation about the equipment for or measure temperature in the BMI, which is a thermographic cover. The problem with the thermography is that it depends, the measurement is not absolutely relative because it depends on the properties of the material. Did you fix those parameters in the camera? Uh, specifically the MCD. CD. Yeah, we tried to maybe avoid any error that came from, from that nature. So one of the most important features that we have to put attention was the visibility. Yes. So we we painted any wall of the, the our structure 
in order to, to maybe to to have the same reflection in all over the face the, of our structure. And also we tried to conduct all the the tests in the same um, day or in all the during all the day uh -huh. in order to not um, to maybe create or to, to take errors from other uh, set up experimentation from other days or another person. So um, there are maybe the only um, techniques that we use, but I'm not sure if that answers your question. Mm, maybe just to type this question, so you adjust this parameter to one, because this parameter is from zero to one. Yeah. Okay, one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the understanding that you isolate. Yes, and we put the same. Um, you repeat the, the feature. Emissivity. emissivity. Yeah, we put the same emissivity in all the, the images that we take from yes. this experiment. Yes. Yeah. And the second one, so finally, you made a correlation between the depth and the temperature, right, which you already got an equation. Yeah. And you got a linear pattern, so an easy way to solve this problem is just a linear regression. Yeah. But this linearity is due to the phenomena of the heat pattern, or because the camera was linear, right? No, the, the, the linear regression was conducted with the monitoring sensors, the thermocouple sensors. So we use a, every point of this is a thermocouple. So these thermocouples are inside all over the, the body phantom, but not the ther thermographic camera. In time you didn't have any vibration because thermocouple there, they, yeah. they have this. We, we record almost by an hour, two hours, and when we uh, saw that the temperature uh, didn't change or didn't have any important change, mm -hmm. we 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 got that uh, point, that, that temperature, this. and we record that. Okay. Thank you. Question here. Hello. I have a question. In can you go back to slide thirteen? How does it affect uh, this effect in the walls? Because, well, ideally it should be like flat, yeah. but it's not. So, how does it affect? Because it's not the same, the right part or the left. Okay, the insulating material it is important because we conducted some tests with and without insulating material. But this is just a um, reference image. We uh, actually we achieve to create like a maybe a more uh, homogeneous pattern, not not like this. But uh, I didn't uh, put a, a lot of images. But yeah, the if we don't put the insulating material, actually the temperature um, just stay at the bottom and maybe is um, um, I don't know how to explain this, but the temperature just stay at the bottom. Maybe we lost that heat for the for the walls without the, the insulating material. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, is there any question online? Thank you very much, Pastor. Okay. Okay. Let's continue with our next presentation, and then, which is a knee brace prototype with electrostimulation system as an auxiliary for post operative treatment for anterior cruciate ligament injuries. And presents Jesus Antonio from Simestar. Okay. 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 Okay.
聞いてしまうと、そんな。ACL injury, uh, the anterior cruciate ligament or ACL, it's an important structure of the knee because it provides stability and controlling the sliding or oscillating the, the tibia over the femur. And, and it's important to do the movements of flexion and extension. Uh, in Mexico, there are um, uh, registered uh, many cases Uh, per year, uh, like six to ten individuals in per thousand. Um, uh, in in all the cases, uh, this this injury requires a surgery surgery intervention. So, uh, as a part of a protocol, the specialist uh, uh, <laughs> recommend to immobilize uh, the knee joint to reduce the pain and the inflammation. So, uh, as um, as a first step of our uh, research and develop this uh, uh, brace, uh, we start for uh, researching the anthropometry of the Mexican people, uh, and according to a study that made of, that made in, in Guadalajara University, uh, we use the fifth percentile uh, as a parameter of. Uh, Design the brace. Uh, here we can see the, the different uh, measures uh, we, we use. Uh, in both cases, uh, we use uh, a range of ages to 18 to uh, 24 years and 18 to 65 years uh, for males and females. Uh, the principal measurements that we use uh, was, uh, were the age, the uh, weight, the knee eight and the calf diameter. Well, uh, here, uh, after we uh, in research those, those uh, measurements, we integrate to, to the uh, prototype, to design the prototype. Uh, the, the main goal of this prototype is to make a brace uh, fit, comfort and effectiveness to the Uh, recovery uh, and the uh, re rehab. Uh, our knee uh, have two main uh, components, that is the uh, femoral uh, subjection and the tibial subjection. Uh, uh, well, for this uh, brief, we research different materials and we, we choose the ABS and the 3003 aluminum alloy. Uh, because ha this, those materials have uh, mechanical properties and durability properties. Uh, in case of the ABS, uh, the thermal tolerance is in a range of minus 20 to 80 degrees. It uh, has an elasticity model of uh, 1,900 millipascals. And this material has a particular combination of low density and high hardness. Uh, of 1.05 grams uh, cubic centimeter. Uh, in the case of uh, aluminum alloy, uh, we choose this uh, uh, material because have mechanical integrity. Uh, their tensile uh, strength is uh, 200 megapascals. The elasticity model is uh, 68.9 gigapascals and have a density of uh, 2.73 Uh, grams uh, cubic uh, centimeters. So, well, uh, the next step of our uh, uh, develop is, is, is uh, this um, project uh, is to integrate an electrostimulation system. 
uh, the primary goal is to uh, integrate uh, muscular contractions with uh, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. Uh, we we uh, discovered that uh, in, in different articles that the electrostimulation, uh, when we apply electrostimulation to a muscle, uh, according to the frequency, uh, has different effects. Uh, as we can see in this table, uh, we can uh, uh, view different um, frequency, frequencies and effects. And in this case, our target is to uh, electri the electrostimulation system have a frequency in in around the 1 to 10 hertz. Um, the effect of this frequency is their uh, the muscle relax. Um, well, uh, about the circuit, uh, this is, uh, uh, I think it's the, the, the main uh, point of this project because, well, in, in this case, we, uh, we put a five voltage supply. Uh, and connect to uh, two uh, five 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 timers uh, in size. Uh, in this case, uh, well, in this part, sorry, um, the first uh, five, the first timer uh, makes a train, the, the main train pulses, and the second uh, contains the second train pulses in this in this part uh, uh, includes or uh, going to be the 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 part of the the current pulses to make the, the electrostimulation. Uh, in this part, the second part of the circuit uh, was uh, the part of uh, a potential uh, that is uh, made of uh, uh, two transistors. Uh, uh, to work in synchronization for the mirror current, and uh, in this in this way we we can ensure to control electrical pulses uh, to to deliver the target uh, current to the muscle. Um, well, uh, our results uh, we apply a bonus story. Um, Applying a uh, 150 uh, kilograms force uh, load uh, to the whole uh, prototype. Uh, in the first image, uh, we can see the uh, the mesh. This mesh have uh, this number of nodes, and uh, it represents the uh, the whole structure of the of the knee. Uh, sorry, of the knee press and. Um, in the second image, uh, we can see uh, uh, a lot of um, points uh, with different colors in green uh, and in blue. Uh, these these points are the points uh, when we uh, sorry the the points that we apply the, the low. And the third image image uh, we can see the 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 deformation scale that suffer our knee. Uh, this deformation scale is uh, between 0 0.81 uh, milli, milli newtons uh, per, square, per square millimeter and uh, 0 0.10 nan, uh, newtons uh, square millimeter. And the deforming node is uh, placed on the third point 43 uh, septometers. Um, uh, we, we can see the deforming uh, prototype, but remember that we applied, we submitted to a extreme uh, uh, low. So that's the reason that it, only in this in this part we can see the the deformation. Uh, those pieces are are made of the aluminum alloy. Um, well, uh, here we can see the the. The, the the whole assembly uh, prototype of the design, and we can see uh, uh, the different uh, stages. Uh, first, we can see the, the assembly, 
Second, we can see the, the uh, electrodes and we can see uh, the circuitry connected to the uh, prototype. Um, well, uh, here uh, we simulate the, on an oscilloscope the, the different uh, uh, waveforms that the circuitry pro provide. Uh, the first one is the green waveform. This uh, waveform uh, activate and deactivate all the whole circuit. The second waveform uh, contains the current pulses and the pink waveform uh, illustrates the current pulses to exhibit the, the consistent and proportional relationship with the input current to the output current. Um, in this case, uh, to, uh, to, to define the, the duration of the pulses, uh, it's to 200 milliseconds, and uh, those, those um, parameters can be modified with the potentiometers. Uh, uh, and May, and this can be uh, achieved to desire the frequency of 1 to 10 hertz. Uh, on this table, uh, we, we have the electrostimulation input versus the output. Um, well, uh, our conclusions uh, are that uh, our knee brace uh, uh, includes an electrostimulation system uh, for a specific electric pulses. Uh, currently, we test the conceptualization, the lowest uh, simulation, the prototyping uh, of the electrical simulation system, and, uh, and a first uh, patient validation to provide the insight, insight to system capabilities, especially to the control and power circuitry. Uh, our perspectives in the near future is to uh, enhance the, the electrostimulation system board and uh, need to, to be uh, more, to, to do more uh, uh, validate performance and therapeutic applications. That's all. Uh, thanks for your time and thanks for their contribution to the Dr. Marcos Mendoza Mejia. Dr. Lorenzo Leita Salas, Dr. Arturo Hernández, and Dr. Arturo eh, Rafael Valladolid. Thank you very much um, for your presentation. Jesus. Is there any question here? Yes. Pues la mina seis. ¿Qué voltaje alimentas? Ah, with pipe works. How was it? Well, uh, in no, yes, um, here, um, yes, um, here, uh, we we uh, we use a uh, power supply with this voltage and with a transistor, we pull pull down to five volts. Uh, uh, Another goal to 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 perform with this uh, circuitry is to uh, use a, a, a power supply with uh, different characteristics. Please, you. No, you in English. No, you in English. No, you in English. No, you in English. No, es que la conversa. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I, I, I didn't use two, two, two rounds, but uh, it's just to simplify uh, the uh, a common a common ground. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Is there any question? Yes, please. How do you? Um, how do you uh, choose the um, simulation parameters to simulate? How do you choose that parameters? Uh, well, I, I didn't understand what you were saying. Because you have parameters for this, the stimulation. How do you, do you decide 
to, to, to choose the, these parameters, to, to use that, that parameters. Uh, did you mean that the another parameter okay. to stimulate? Because you, you said that you use stems to stimulate. The yes. Well, uh, in further studies and uh, articles, uh, we will read that those frequencies can be used to, to uh, induce relax to the muscle. Uh, how do you val validate that it was uh, right? Do uh, you use it in healthy people? Well, uh, remember that it, it is a first uh, prototype. Uh -huh. so. Uh, th this uh, this point we need to validate in, in other people. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to uh, make more more uh, studies, tests, tests. Yes, yeah, so uh, more tests to 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 validate that 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 frequency is uh, correct to produce or induce relax to the muscle. And what about uh, electrical security? You use uh, bat batteries to to to, uh, to supply to, to as a power supply for the city. Uh, yeah, well, well, for the moment, no. We use an, an I don't know what to say in English, power but a power supply, supply to connect to to the um, to a in adapter. adapter. Yes, like mm -hmm. to connect it to a electrical installation in your house mm -hmm. uh, that that is another point that we need to to modify because the purpose is to uh, be uh, not it's not to to be necessary to connect with a, a, a static uh, connection mm -hmm. to, so to, to, to 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 be portable yes what about the safety, electrical safety? Mm, that's a good question because I I I, don't, I didn't um, expect that. But maybe in while while during the modifications, we can we can. I, I know that there is a prototype. Yes. But why uh, your first uh, option was batteries? Why why you? Didn't you use uh, batteries instead of uh, connected to the power supply? Okay. Yes. Uh, well, uh, in in this case, we use an um, adapter to uh, well, just to 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 to, to test, uh, not to um, to be. Uh, Group in a real, real environment. Oh, thank you. But in the future, you will. Yes, yes, it is. One to be safety and support. Yes. So I think the the point of using batteries is critical, right? Yes. And also, you mentioned the population that would be improved. Commonly in the prototype uh, stages of, of uh, our research, uh, maybe batteries would be, if they are rechargeable, it's an option, no? And so in this sense, I would like to ask, part of your perspective is just to solve this problem and these batteries. You will still quiter the design you propose should, should they change or you will remain the same, uh, the same, the components, I mean, the kind of transistor, the kind, the the, the, the resistors, the capacitors, would be intact. Only you change to batteries, or you should redesign your sequence. Um, well, in this case, we need to test if it's necessary. Uh, but I think it's not necessary because uh, we we use a, a pull down transistor. To five volts and all the voltage battery uh, function, but I, I I don't know. You must not confuse the stage of control, which is a TTL technology, because you are using an integrated circuit five five five, which is a power supply with five volts, not more. 
and the power stage, which is the, the electric simulation, which is not powered by 5 volts, it no. is powered directly with that power supply. Yes, you should understand that there are different states, okay? Okay. So your electric simulation is not powered by 5 volts. That's a fact, and we can see it. Yes. So now the, the reason that you are powering down is because you're using a, a control stage, which is, let's say, okay? So if you use a battery or a power supply, how would you know you should change or not your circular? Well, I think at the end you should know which power is delivering your sick figure. Yes. Because at, at the end you want to connect the patient with an, a specific um, frequency with a specific power determined by one. If you connect the power supply and you connect a battery exactly with the same circuitry and with these two power supplies giving you exactly the same quantity of watts, should not change. Yes. But if you connect a, a battery and still we don't discuss what kind of battery it could be nine volts, could be six volts, maybe a four triple a double A, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes. I think logically the watts will change. Yes. And you have to change your circuit. Yes. Right? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean that time. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much for your thank you. Okay, we will go to our last presentation, which is polyvinyly then fluoride membranes as force detectors for bruxism behavior. And presents Bernardo from Simbernas. Oh, que se sabe, sí. Eh, clic en parar. Ahí está. Hi, my name is Bernardo Flores. Today, as part of the sessions for this uh, conference, I will address the work titled Polyvinylidine Chloride Membranes as Force Detectors uh, for Proxism Behavior. This talk briefly describes uh, the proposal uh, application of piezoelectric sensors in bite force monitoring, considering the current approximations, instrumental approximations in the assessment of bruxism. As a general overview, uh, the motivation for this, this work is uh, uh, bruxism is a clinical condition or anatomical or physiological manifestations whose, whose symptoms alter the correct function of, of the masticatory system. 
the magnitude of the harmful effects of these symptoms uh, generate evidence that needs to be objectively uh, collected. Uh, uh, the definition of oxygen is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, it is correct. It's a, a rhythmic, constipatory, and muscular activity uh, characterized by by bracing, bracing or or grinding the teeth, or by thrusting the maxilla against the mandible against the maxilla. It is uh, uh, from from 85% to 95% of the global population have suffered this uh, condition at some point in their lives. It is considered that uh, it is estimated that 8 to 31% of the global population suffers proxism. It is important to size this data because it depends on the methodology uh, used to diagnose this manifestation or no? this behavior. It is classified in, in two uh, groups, awake and sleep proxism. Uh, the symptoms uh, for these uh, two manifestations are not related, but there is still debate about it. Um, both both uh, manifestations can coexist in the same individual. Standard size tool for the assessment of proxism is the latest consensus uh, 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 tool uh, developed uh, by in the odontology field to implement uh, a valid methodology for the assessment of root system. This this tool is divided into two axes, but we only uh, focus on the instrumental based assessment, which refers to the tools that uh, generate. Uh, objective and quantifiable uh, information that can uh, help us to assess bruxism. Uh, the gold standard in, in this methodology, in this uh, axis, this category is polysomnography. Polysomnography is a study, is a study, uh, is the only study to determine or diagnose correctly bruxism. It is also, it's also used to diagnose all kind of uh, sleep disorder. Uh, however, on the other hand, there are other uh, approximations that seek to that not replace uh, polysomnography, but uh, compensate for its limitations. In that sense, there are three main uh, categories, ecological uh, commentary assessment. It's, it is the use of uh, and mobile apps to to make uh, the subject self-aware of the uh, of its masticatory activity. It is uh, uh, there are also biological marker, markers. This is there. These are um, uh, measures, uh, discrete measures of, uh, of the uh, muscular capability. Or for the masticatory capability, uh, like uh, MRI, uh, muscular volume, muscular thickness using ultrasound or by force. Uh, on the other, the, the last category is specific purpose instruments. This is a whole kind of uh, uh, devices designed to treatment to for treatment for. Uh, uh, monitor for the for the tech events or generate stimuli. It is it is a whole uh, it is a whole kind of devices, commercial and academic. We are, the proposal we are uh, uh, generating it is on this on this aspect. On the other hand, the polyvinyl fluoride, uh, for short, is PVDF, is a piezoelectric material. It is uh, these piezopolymeric materials. Briefly, there are uh, grouped in two main uh, categories that are uh, naturally extracted, which are uh, crystalline materials like quartz or topaz, and the manufacture, which are ceramic and polymer. 
PBDF it is grouped as a semi-crystalline bulk polymer. It is it, it has uh, high performance uh, uh, properties like uh, as um, as a um, uh, as a as a plastic material. Particularly, uh, we we like to uh, uh, highlight its lightweight, flexible. No, it is flexible, non-toxic, high impact, add to strength and chemical stability. These character, these features uh, uh, make make PBDF a well uh, sensor and an actuator. As a sensor, it is important to 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 assess the the the, the capability of PBDF. In, in, in due to its high ability to detect minimum changes in potential uh, uh, electrical potential and high sensitivity to strain. So. Particularly in the odontology applications, the development of applications with membrane type polymeric sensors that adopt the shape of the dental cusps represents an alternative to the current uh, methodologies used in the assessment or in general terms in the odontology field. This, this work form, form part of a, a, an extended uh, research, research uh, that is divided in two axes. We we only focus on the isopolymeric biocompatible materials applications. The other part is the masticatory exploration. Right. Um, for the the methodology employed in in this work, we use PBDF transfer membrane, which uh, it's an Imbleon PSQ. This type of uh, material it is used commercially in the uh, in the in, in molecular uh, biology molecular bi biology field. It is used to uh, to detect proteins. We use this material uh, due to its uh, piezoelectric properties. With this material, we we manufacture to two different sensors. These sensors are uh, uh, developed with two sheets of copper, both in each side. The, the geometry of the sensors uh, and, the, and the dimensions are, are determined by, the dental, by a dental model, an anatomical dental model. And uh, uh, we, we develop uh, two different sensors in order to to test them with one single run. In this, uh, with these sensors, we develop also uh, a metallic and acrylic base to support them while we exert uh, sustained force. This is the circuit used to to condition this the signal. The mechanical frame that we use is the mechanical arrangement. It is uh, it consists as a, a, a scissor jack, an inverted scissor jack, a load cell, the acrylic base, and the circuitry to uh, to, to monitor the, the changes in capacitance and to the, to uh, accommodate the the signal from the load cell. The load cell, uh, it is a Yoto cube type S load cell. It has a uh, range from zero to 300 kilograms. And the signal uh, extracted from the sensors, we use uh, an oscilloscope. Each signal is, it is a, uh, 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 we use in, in this circuitry a 555 uh, multi vibrator uh, circuit which uh, relates or correlates 
the uh, different the variations in capacitance from the sensors if we uh, keep constant the resistance. The results extracted uh, from the first calibration, we conducted uh, three, three series of three tests. In the, this, these are the graphics. We can, we can observe a linear tendency as we increase the force, the sustained force, we see a decrease in the in the frequency in both in both uh, in both sensors. This is uh, this is a, a well a well result that surprised us. On the on the other hand, we also um, conduct another experiment where we simulate the bruxism. Uh, behavior, it's a sway of the mandible. We, are con we condition the, the acrylic base in a rotatory movement to uh, simulate the, the, the oscillatory behavior of the mandible. In this experiment, we, we can see the downward tendency when the, the, the test is, uh, is, is static, when the force is applied uh, without movement, and the, the, the orange graphic represents the response of the circuit when the, the, the base, uh, the, the acrylic base is moving, no? it is oscillating. In these experiments, uh, well, the, the static uh, test corresponds with the expected results, but the, the the response of the of the sensors um, keep constant along the the swept of the of the test. Mm -hmm. This is uh, these results need to be carefully studied because we cannot rule out uh, categorically categor categorically. Uh, we cannot rule out these these results and say that the sensors cannot detect processing behavior. The sensors keep constant; they don't uh, go off the limits. This this is this is a a response that we don't uh, uh, understand yet, but we are still studying. As conclusions, uh, the conducted experiments are robust evidence indicating that the PBDF membranes possess exceptional capabilities to detect and measure static as well as dynamic forces. This is this has to be uh, furtherly studied, specifically uh, specifically in the dynamic tests. A linear correlation has been observed between applied force and the output frequency provided by these sensories but my key sensory membranes made from PBDF material. And finally, the, this work presents an important opportunity to develop alternative instrumental approaches for obtaining quantifiable research, which can be effectively utilized by research odontology groups and to establish connections between characteristic clinical patterns indicative of various masticatory disorders, such as bruxism. Mm -hmm. By exploding these associations, it becomes feasible to potentially identify specific manifestations related to different variants of bruxism. Well, uh, this is only a brief uh, talk of uh, an extensive uh, research. Well, but on behalf of uh, me and Dr. Ernesto Suaste Gomez, I would like to thank you all. And if you have any questions, Feel free to express them. Thank you. Okay, any questions, please? Did you buy the PBDF sensor? Or yes. It, yes? It, it's a commercial. It's quite a commercial thing. Product. Okay. And which are the characteristics of this PBDF? The dimensions and also the frequency. And uh, 
uh, this this product uh, only describes its uh, physical uh, characteristics applied to the uh, the purpose of this product, which are uh, for Western blottings. It is called the technique used for that use this material. So in terms of frequency, in the ele electrical characteristical characteristics are not reported for this this, this specific material. They, the, there are reported uh, physical characteristics. It is used like, like a filter. Okay. Proteins sustain, uh, are, are uh, filtered with this. And the, the final idea is to put that uh, sensor inside the mouth. And how do you decide the dimensions that you use in your experiments? We, it, it is uh, the same dimensions that you, you will use in in your final prototype. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. We we determine the, the dimensions of these sensors according to a dental anatomical dental model. But there is some. I, I think that it depends on the race and uh, and the age of the person. But as I mentioned, changes. Yes, of course. But we use uh, a standard size motor. Then okay. one for an For an adult. Yes. I would like to ask you, how did you come to this idea of using this material for these applications? Well, this material it is, is, is long used in the work done in the laboratory for other applications like humidity sensor, as a temperature sensor, but not with this application. And and I have to I have the interest to to utilize this material in this particular field. I am inclined to the ontology field. So you knew the problem of ontology and it is that idea of the knowledge that you got in other applications. Yes. And there is no other reported work about this. Okay. this Another question. Do, yes. do you know why they use force instead of uh, pressure? And uh, why use force? Why, why they, the, the odontologists, they use force instead of pressure? Well, that, that, that is uh, a, a, a misunderstood term because they use it uh, changeably. How okay. they, don't different, they don't use a difference between force and pressure. And is there a no uh, common values uh, is a range that we, we can consider uh, uh, normal for a person. For for white force, yes, mm -hmm. it, it is. Well, it depends on on the methodology used to to measure white force. Okay. But uh, it is it is known that about uh, fifty to sixty kilograms force for a male. And you and, and you your tests were. Done in that range? The static test of up to 8, 80 kilograms. Okay. The, the, the dynamic test up to 30 kilograms. But the human can, can generate more than 100 uh -huh. kilograms when there are dysfunctions. Thank you. You have any other questions here? Yeah. Online, do we have any questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Fernando. Okay, uh, thank you all for being here in this session, uh, We finished all the work.